When we encounter a performance problem, the first step is to determine what is causing it. Our goal is to reduce the response time and therefore we need to understand why the server requires a certain amount of time to respond to a query. In other words, we need to measure where the time goes. This leads to an important principle of optimization. We cannot reliably optimize what we cannot measure. Therefore, our first job is to measure where the time is spent. Then, we reduce or eliminate whatever unnecessary work is doing to achieve the result. MyScale offers a large set of system views that allows administrators and developers alike to take a deeper look into what is really going on into their system. There is no way to improve performance and reliability without first collecting the necessary data. Afterward, we could make educated decisions based on facts. The performance schema is a gold mine when it comes to information about the performance of your queries. However, the challenge is to really make sense out of this plethora of tables and metrics. Thus, the objective in this section is to make use of MySQL statistics and make it easier for us to take advantage of their insights. These tables will allow us to get very detailed information about the queries that are executing on the instance, though the table most often used is Events Statements Summary by Digest. This is essentially a report of all the queries that have been executed on the instance since the table was last reset. Normally, this happens when restarting MySQL. Now, let's check what we can find in this view. Since this table contains too many fields to fit properly on the screen, I will use a parameter to display the output vertically. So, instead of a semicolon, I'll use backslash uppercase G. Now it's more readable, but there is a lot of noise and it's difficult to make sense out of these results. It would be useful to sort them somehow. A good candidate for ordering would be the total time a query has spent on the server. This is shown by the field sum underscore timer wait and it represents the number of times the query has been executed multiplied by the average execution time. So, let's sort on this field. And also limit the results to the first 10 queries. Now, we can get a sense of which are the most expensive queries. The essential fields are digest text, which contains the normalized query. For example, these two queries will be normalized to a common form. Count star represents the number of times the query has been executed. As mentioned, sum underscore timer underscore wait shows the total amount of time that has been spent executing this particular query. And sum underscore lock underscore time shows the total amount of time that has been spent waiting for table locks. The other columns from the list might be opportunities to find queries for optimization. The trick is to search for the things that are important. What qualifies as important also depends on your situation. For example, if you know from your monitoring that there are problems with a large number of internal temporary tables that are using a lot of memory or disk, then these two fields are good candidates for filtering and sorting. However, when we don't know what is causing the performance problem, a good place to start is always the top 10 time-consuming queries. As mentioned, using a simple select on this view won't be really helpful. There could be a lot of queries executed on this server even if they are normalized. Therefore, when we make use of this view, we should always create a sorted output so that the most relevant information can be seen instantly. For this, I have prepared a query that will be available in the description and I will just copy paste it here. Each row shows the response time as a total and as a percent of the overall response time the number of times the query has been executed, the average response time per query, and an abstraction of the query. 
This shows the top 10 queries ordered by the total time consumed and makes it clear how expensive each of these types of query is relative to each other as well as to the whole. Checking the top 1000 queries is usually not worth your time to optimize because they contribute a very small portion of the response time overall. Normally, the first queries are responsible for most of the load on the system. Next, we could check the average time for execution for one query so that we could recognize if the runtime for that query is higher than expected. At the same time, the output is not really readable for a human, since the measurements are in picoseconds. The formatted version of this view, already ordered by the total latency in descending order, it's called statement analysis and it's part of the sys schema. Select all from sys, statement analysis, and limit to 10. The sys schema contains pre cooked reports built upon the performance schema. However, the downside of these views is that we can't really change them or get additional information if we want to drill down to the root cause of a problem. Going back to event statements summary by digest. Although execution time profiling help us to identify what types of activity contribute the most to the elapsed time, it doesn't really tell us why. In practice, when a task is responsible for a lot of elapsed time, basically time spent on the CPU, we might be able to drill into the issue and find that some of the execution time is spent waiting at some lower level. For example, a lot of time might be consumed by a select statement against a table, but at a lower level, that time might be spent waiting for I.O. to complete. For example, to fetch a large set of data, which will be filtered out at a later stage. To find out why it took so much to do a simple select, we'll have to drill down into that state and produce a profile of the subtasks it executed. We'll check this in the next section. Another key point is that queries executed as prepared statement, that is, the one executed from client libraries, are not included in the statement tables. Normally, you need to use prepared statements instances. Still, the same principle applies there as well. Queries are tasks and they are composed of subtasks and those subtasks consume time. To optimize a query, we must optimize its subtasks by eliminating them, making them happen fewer times, or making them happen more quickly. In general, you can think of a query lifetime by mentally following the query through its sequence diagram from the client to the server, where it is parsed, planned, and executed, and then back again to the client. Execution is one of the most important stages in a query lifetime. It involves a lot of calls to the storage engine to retrieve rows, as well as post-retrieval operations such as grouping and sorting. While accomplishing all these tasks, the query spends time on the network, in the CPU, in operations such as statistics and planning, locking, and most especially, calls to the storage engine to retrieve rows. These calls consume time in memory, CPU, and especially I.O. if the data isn't in memory. In every case, excessive time may be consumed because the operations are performed needlessly, performed too many times, or too slow. The goal of the optimization is to avoid that by eliminating or reducing operation or making them faster. Next, we'll see what other situations are there that are common candidates for optimization. Going back to event statements summary by digest, let's see some examples or some conditions that justify further investigations. A large amount of examined rows compared to the number of rows sent back to the client. This may suggest poor index usage since large number of rows are sent to the client but discard it afterward. If the number of full joins is high, this suggests that either an index is needed or there is a join condition missing. A full table scan will occur when there is no index for the join condition or there is no join condition. If the number of range checks is high, 
This may suggest that we need to change the indexes on the tables. When a secondary index is used, but the range scan includes a large part of the table, using a secondary index can end up more expensive than performing a full table scan. If the number of internal temporary tables created in disk is high, this may suggest that we need to consider which indexes are used for sorting and grouping and the amount of memory allowed to internal temporary tables. Writing on disk is still more expensive than internal memory. Finally, if the number of sort merges is high, this may suggest that this query can benefit from a larger sort buffer. Still, as mentioned earlier, what a matrix qualifies as important also depends on your situation. Normally, these views are used in combination with other views and tables. For example, you may detect that the CPU usage is very high. A typical cause for high CPU usage is large table scans. So, you may look at the schema tables with full table scans view and find out that one or more tables are returning large number of rows through table scans. Then you go on and query statements with full table scans and find out statements that are using that table without using an index. And let's sort by no index used count descending. The I.O. performance is vital for MySQL databases. Data is read and written to the disk in various places and other than the table spaces and indexes, we have redo logs, binary logs and so forth. An increase in I.O. count or latencies, it's neither a good or a bad thing on its own. However, if you identified a certain problem, for example, if you determined that the disk I.O. is a bottleneck because the disks are 100% utilized, then we can use the table I.O. and file I.O. views to determine what is causing the increase. We can then work backward to find the tables involved. There are multiple performance schema tables that include latency statistics for the table I.O., out of which table I.O. weights summary by index usage can be particularly useful. For example, using this query code in the description, we can find out how many times an index has been used or not for a specific table, in this case the city table from word schema. This example shows the number of rows read on the table. First, we see rows that are read using an index and then the null index, which means no index was used while reading those rows. Here, we can observe that the reads made with an index are insignificant compared to the reads made without an index. So, this could be a hint that a lot of unnecessary reads are being made, that is, a lot of I.O. This could probably have been avoided if an index was used. It is very useful to take a minute to consider when the fetch, insert, update and delete counters increase. Consider the world city table, which has a primary key for the ID column and a secondary index on the country code column. Secondary indexes are simply those that are not the primary key. First, we'll do a simple select. Select all from city, where ID is equal to 5. Then, I'll use the table I.O. weights summary by table from performance schema to check how many I.O. operations are happening. We have one read and one fetch. Next, we'll use the country code, which is a secondary index, for filtering. Select all from city. where country code is NLD, Netherlands. Now we get 28 rows. 
If we check again the statistics, we get 29 rows read and 29 rows fetched. Finally, we filter by the name of the city. So, select all from city, where name is equal to Amsterdam. We got one result, but if we check the statistics, we have more than 4k rows read and more than 4k rows fetched from the database. And this is simply because there is no index on the name column, so no surprise. The whole table was read. What is interesting though, is that if we do an update, for example, update city, set the name to Amsterdam 1, where name it's Amsterdam. Again, more than 4k rows were read and fetched, even though this was an update. Now, consider how many rows are fetched for each of these three examples. Again, we are using where closes with a select update or delete statement, as well as executing an insert statement. The insert statement doesn't have a WHERE clause, so it's a little different. For each type of statement, the number of reads and writes are listed. The ROWS column shows the number of rows returned or affected for each statement. This means that we can set up three types of filters depending on the index that is used or lack of it, by primary key, by secondary index, or by no index. A key takeaway from this table is that update and delete statements are also reads even though they're write statements. The reason is that the rows must be located before they can be changed. Another observation is that when using secondary index or no index for updating or deleting rows, then many more records are read than updated. In our example, there were 4000 rows fetched because the table was relatively small. But on larger tables, this issue can be more evident. While errors are not directly related to query tuning, an error does suggest that something is going wrong. A query resulting in an error will still be using resources, but when the error occurs, it will be all in vain. So indirectly, errors affect the query performance by adding unnecessary load to the system. There are also errors that are more directly related to the performance, such as errors caused by failure to obtain locks. When there are multiple concurrent requests that need to change a resource, for example, a row in a table, that row must be locked while being changed by one single request in order to avoid data inconsistencies. If that request takes too long to be processed, this will impact all other requests that are waiting for their turn. There are five tables in the performance schema grouping the errors encountered by different classifications. For example, to check how many times a deadlock has occurred grouped by the account, you can use the following query. Where error name is equal to er underscore lock underscore deadlock. Fortunately, there have been no deadlocks raised for the root account at the localhost. The first row, where the user and the host are null, represents background threads. We started this section by going through the performance schema and recognizing which information is available and which is most relevant. Particularly, event statements summary by digest is a goldmine when looking for queries that may have performance issues. However, we shouldn't restrict ourselves to just looking at queries. We should also take into consideration table and file I.O. as well as whether queries cause errors. These errors may include lock timeouts and deadlocks.